As we get started on stockholders' equity, it's important that you've analyzed and looked through the chapter um, for this stockholders' equity section. So make sure you've gone through, reviewed any PowerPoint slides that are posted, any notes that are posted, and read through the chapter regarding stockholders' equity before you really get into the problems because you need a base understanding of corporations. For example, corporations are formed in accordance with the corporation laws of individual states. And since there's 50 states um, in the United States, then there could be 50 different sets of laws. Um, state laws are not uniform in that case, but they do share some similarities. Uh, thanks to the widespread adoption of the Model Business Corporation Act. Uh, this act is designed to serve as a guide to the states in the development of their corporation statutes. But even though there is this guide out there, still uh, states have their own set of rules. So when we're looking at these entries, we're going to give the specific or not specific state law. We're not going to look at different state laws here. We're going to do a broad picture to gain an understanding of how it works. And then when you get into a different state where the laws may be a little bit different, the overall concept remains the same. Okay. One thing that's the same is the actual process of incorporating a business is very similar in all states. Um, the company must file what we call an Articles of Incorporation or a corporate charter. It depends on state, but same concept. In that, they actually describe the nature of the firm's business activities, what they're going to do. It does talk about the shares they're going to issue and then the composition of the board of directors to begin the company. Now, when we talk about shares, there's different classes of shares, and shares are stock typically, in that every company can have a different type of class. So we're going to be generic here, and we're typically going to focus on two types, and that's going to be common stock and preferred stock. Okay. So when we talk about shares of stock, we have to understand in the Articles of Incorporation or in the Corporate Charter, there is what's known as authorized shares. That's the number of shares we're allowed to sell. So some terminology here. One, authorized is how much we're allowed to sell. Issued means we have sold it out. And then issued and outstanding means we've sold it and it's still outstanding in the general market. In other words, it's controlled outside our company. So that's our three terms we have to be familiar with. The next thing we need to understand one, we've already taught there's multiple classes of stock, and stock really talks about the rights. So common shares is one type that we're going to talk about. In the Articles of Incorporation for common shares, typically it's the ownership's rights uh, held by common shareholders where they have the right to vote. So they get to vote on matters such as the board of directors and many times mergers and acquisitions. They do have a right to dividends, to share in the profits of the dividends when they're actually declared. Now, nothing forces the company to declare dividends, typically speaking, but if they do declare, the shareholders get a right in those dividends. If the company is liquidated, typically a shareholder does have some right to assets if it's liquidated. If any remain, typically shareholders are last to get those funds. And in many cases, they have preemptive rights, which means they have the right to maintain their ownership percentage if the company issues new shares. So that's common shares. Then you have preferred shares. Now, preferred stock is similar, but they do not typically have voting rights. But since they don't have voting rights, many times they have first rights to dividends and they have first rights to assets in a liquidation. So types of stock really depend on the rights that they're given. So in this class or in, in our class here, we're just going to look at those two types of classes. If a company issues different types of stock, it has to be clearly stated within the stock what the rights are to that shareholder. Okay, And we'll talk more about that as we go. And the last thing we need to discuss really is the concept of a par value. Par value um, <clears throat> is really irrelevant, sad to say. It really has no bearing, but since there are par value laws still in existence where we have to have those legal capital requirements out there, we do have to a lot of times deal with par value. It's really a, just a prevalent practice that has little significance other than historically assigning a, a par value to a share. Par value originally indicated the real value of the shares, and all shares were issued at the par price, but that is no longer the case. During the 19th and 20th centuries, um, selling shares for less than par value, known as watered shares, 
received a great deal of attention and they were subject to many lawsuits. So investors and creditors contended that they relied on the par value as a permanent investment in the corporation and therefore net assets must always be at least at that amount. In other words, net assets the company could not go below the, below the par value of the, of the share of stock. But the problem is that's not really what happens when we get out there. So not only was it assumed that this par value was what was invested, but it was also defined by early corporation law as the amount of net assets not available for distribution to shareholders as dividends or otherwise. So it all plays into that. That really became a point where it became meaningless. So many companies began turning to par values with a very low par value score, often to the pennies, to escape watered shares liability of issuing shares below that arbitrary par value and to limit the restriction on distributions. This is very common today. So if you still have state laws that have that legal capital requirement placed on, we will have shares that have par values. So really, <clears throat> they, they have no real protection in that. So from our standpoint, what is a par value? We could go on and on and on about the, the arbitrary nature of it, but in accounting, the par value is what we must carry the stock at. So when you go in and you record stock, if it has a par value, the common stock account itself will be recorded at par. We have no other choice. If it's a no par, then it's carried at whatever price we issue it for. There's also a thing called a stated value where a lot of times the stated value will be added instead of a par value. So it'll be no par with a stated. And again, stated value is just as arbitrary as a par value. So from our standpoint, stated and par is treated the exact same way. When you have a stated or par value, you must record the stock at that value. If there is a no par or no stated situation, then we get to carry the stock at its market price, whatever the, the owner pays for it. So that's really all that means. All right, so with those few definitions there, again, you need to read through the material to really get a full understanding of how that works. But our goal here is to work through problems so we can see how we treat it in accounting. So let's look at exercise one here. The following is a news report, or news item reported by uh, Reuters. Washington, January 29th. Knowlton Medical Group, a maker of reconstructive implants for knees and hips on Tuesday, filed to sell 2 million shares of common stock. In a filing with U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, it said it plans to use the proceeds from the offering for general corporate purposes, working capital, research and development, and acquisitions. After the sale, there will be about 30.5 million shares outstanding in the Arlington, Tennessee-based company. So in other words, they've already got shares out. We're just issuing 2 million more shares. Um, according to the SEC filing, excuse me, Knowlton shares closed at $18.10 on NASDAQ. The common stock of Knowlton Medical Group has a par of $2 per share. All right. Prepare the journal entry to record the sale of shares, assuming the price existing when the announcement was made and ignoring share issue costs. So right now we're not dealing with share issue costs. We're just talking about sales price. So what we're doing is we're assuming that when we actually issued these 2 million shares, the price was $18.10 in that. And we're saying there's no issues, issue costs. Now, when we issue shares of stock, what happens? Well, really, we put the date. So I'm just gonna put a one here. We don't know when they issued. They asked permission on the 29th. That does not mean they sold 2 million shares on the 29th. We actually do not know the date that they actually issued them. This is just the date that they've asked for permission on, this, on the exchange to actually issue them. So when we issue stock, what do we get? Well, a company can issue stock for multiple things. They can get cash for that issuance. They can get services such as legal services or accounting services if the, the accountant or the lawyer is willing to accept shares. Or they can use it to purchase equipment or land. Um, so really what we debit when we issue shares depends on what we're going to get. Now in this case it says we're getting the issue price of 1810. So we're getting cash here. So our cash is going to go in at 1810. Multiply that 1810 by the 2 million shares. So take just a moment there, pause the video, do that multiplication out and see what you get. You should get 36,200,000. So again, $18.10 per share times 2 million shares. That's the amount of cash we're getting in. Now keep in mind, we would have issue costs, so that would actually reduce that amount, but we're ignoring that fact right now just to get the overall concept. 
Now, what are we getting in its, uh, or for that cash, what are we giving in its place? We don't get money for free, so we're giving out shares of stock. We're actually handing owners two million more shares. Now, when we talk about common stock, it must be carried at par value, if par exists. Again, that's not part of the account name. I just wanted to type that in there to remind you. We must carry the common stock at its par value. So what do we do then? Well, go back into our problem. We see that our par is two cents. Again, just keep in mind that's an arbitrary number due to legal issues out there. So that two penny par for us simply means that's the amount we carry for our common stock. Typically, it is the lowest price we can sell our stock for because if you sell it for less than par, it can cause legal issues. So keep that in mind too. Le legally, typically, you cannot sell it for less than par. So that's the reason pars are typically very low. So that two cent par, we're going to multiply that by that same two million shares and you get a lovely 40,000. So again, how did we calculate that? Well, we took the 2 million shares and we multiplied that by the penny, well, two penny par, I guess, that's the way to say that. So two cents. So two million at two cents gives us 40,000 that we record at. Now here's the problem. In accounting, we know that debits must equal credit. So where does the difference go? Well, the difference is going to go into a paid in capital account. in excess of par. Now different books call it different things. I like to abbreviate it PISIP. Paid in capital in excess of par or PISIP. Now I typically also like to di dictate what type it is so I'll put on there common. So we do have paid in capital in excess of par on our common shares. And again everybody's a little bit different in the exact wording there. That's just my preference. So typically I'll call it PISIP for our common. And if we issued preferred shares or any other type of class, it would be the exact same thing, except we would call it in excess of par on preferred and preferred stock. Now, that paid in capital is really the owner's investment above par. So it's going to be the difference between the 36.2 and the 40. And that brings us to 36,160,000. Another way to look at that is that it is the difference in the price. Notice we sold the stock for $18.10. We carry it at two cents. So basically that's a difference of $18.08. You multiply that 1808 by the 2 million shares. And that would give you the 36,160,000. So really the paid in capital is the difference between the market price because the what we receive, the cash here, is carried at the market price whereas the common stock is carried at the par value. So the PICIP, the paid in capital in excess of par, is going to be the difference between the two. Market minus par times the shares and give you the same thing. So it really is a plug figure, but it truly does have a dollar value. And in this case, it would be $18.08 per share. All right. Okay, so that concludes exercise one and some background information regarding par value and common stock. Again, make sure you read through the chapters for your stockholders' equity, wherever you're watching this from, and whatever chapter it is. It's chapter 18 from the book we're current, currently using, which is Bison. All right, get ready. We'll be posting exercise two here shortly.